Hi, everybody. Welcome to uh, day two, uh, DroidCon, uh, my, my little talk here. It's not a thing we call Doppel. Um, it is Android-centric code sharing. Uh, this is the website where you can read uh, all these things sort of at length at your leisure. Um, my name is Kevin Galligan. I'm, I'm president of a company called TouchLab. TouchLab was for several years an Android-only consulting company based in New York, started around 2010. Uh, I've been doing Android since before the G1 even came out, uh, and Java since forever. Um, our company runs the big Android meetup in New York, which is about 4,000 people. We also run um, DroidCon NYC for, uh, since 2014. Um, the 2017 edition is in like two, three weeks, so throwing that out there if you want to check it out. Um, the short version is uh, lots of Android, and we're heavily involved with the Android folks. <laughs> So, uh, Doppel, it's Android code sharing, Android-centric code sharing built on J2OBJC in a sentence. Um, so what is J2OBJC? Uh, this is a framework that converts Java to Objective-C. And when I first heard about this, it sounded uh, terrible. And this should probably sound terrible to anybody who understands what that means. It is made by Google. In fact, the person who started it, uh, Tom Ball, used to work for James Gosling. If you look at his LinkedIn page, he has James Gosling leaving a recommendation to him. If you don't know who James Gosling is, don't worry about it. Um, they use it in Sheets and Inbox and a few other large-scale applications. And uh, the reason is, uh, talking to them, like they built this whole spreadsheet library in Java. And as you can imagine, a spreadsheet library has a lot of logic and a lot of changing and improving logic over time. So recoding that sucks, right? So they kind of built this whole thing. Um, it is very stable. It is very difficult to use. There are no standard build tools. A lot of make files. I don't know if you edited make files any time in the recent past, but they are terrible. And it is just logic. They really don't focus on anything outside of the code and basic stuff, right? And so that's inbox. So J2WJC, uh, the JRE, uh, Lang, IO, uh, Util, and a bunch of other stuff is included in uh, J2OBJC Runtime, which runs on iOS. They have a little bit of Android, like Log, uh, but they really keep it intentionally very Android light. Uh, JUnit, Makito, and a few other things like Guava, yada yada, right? Uh, Doppel, what Doppel is and what it adds, so we'll go through that. There is a Gradle plugin, and this is built off an earlier Gradle plugin that we started with that uh, was abandoned and forked. Uh, it takes your code, which is Java, potentially other stuff in C++, and which you probably won't have, but you might. Um, and then the Doppel dependencies, so anything that you've declared that you're going to need on the iOS side, and puts it in the Gradle plugin. Then your J2OBJC makes your Objective-C, and then your dependencies are put somewhere that is meaningful to your environment. Uh, so that's down here, Gradle plugin and the library format for the Doppel dependencies. Then we have Android extensions. So for data storage, it's a SQLite database, shared preferences, uh, threading is Looper Message Queue Handler, that whole thread, that whole stack. Um, then context, and by that I mean Android context, capital C, is implemented in part on iOS. Anything that makes sense, some things do not. Uh, there are annotations, so nullable, non-null, target API, suppress lint, uh, what I call compilables, which is stuff that doesn't really have anything to do in iOS, but if you don't have it, your code may run into issues of not compiling because you want it for, for Android. And then uh, question marks, some other crap that went away in there because uh, something inside one of these other things depends on it. All this code came from the Android open source framework, so SQLite database was implemented on iOS using that same code, right? Same thing with the looper message queue. Some of it's modified, for instance, um, you, you know, for the main thread coming from iOS, you have to relinquish control back to the main thread, so the looper is somewhat different in this context. Um, so that's that. And then we added testing support. So right now there's some instrumentation testing support. So in Android side, like maybe use Web Electric to get a context that's usable in a, in a testing environment. We created a similar thing um, in iOS, and then we have this delegate test runner that will, if you're in Java, will use Web Electric, and if you're not, it'll use iOS. This isn't meant for like integration testing all the way top down, but really from your view model all the way down to your database and network calls or just unit tests anywhere in between, right? Um, helper code, so things that'll help you run the JUnit test in an Xcode environment. Uh, platform util, some other stuff. And then also um, which is some weird thing. So like today, Mockhedo from J2OBJC supports mock but not spy, 
which was a little bit interesting. So uh, in the very short term, we have a thing called mock gen, which will actually annotation processing generate a new class that's like mocked, which uh, in retrospect is probably not the best way to, to go. Uh, pretty soon after our V1-ish release, we're going to make sure we get Mockito fully running and some other stuff, but you know, one day at a time. I'm testing support, and then Doppel libraries, and this is what Doppel is really from. It's short for Doppelganger, right? Uh, we have JSON and Dagger, and they're pretty much 100% standard, and they run on iOS, no problem. Uh, Retrofit 2, and, and under the hood, it uses OKHTTP, OK which actually was a problem on J2OBJC, and like, I've had several conversations with Jesse Wilson, who wanted to get this to work, um, but at the end of the day, it was just a lot easier and safer to just use URL session in iOS, which is natively doing this stuff, and HTTP2, and, and SSL streams, and all this kind of stuff, you just get it, right? And that's working pretty well. Uh, SQL Cypher, for example, is JNI and Java. Uh, it works on iOS, but you got a lot of iOS shit that you're actually doing. It's a long story. And then, you know, the architecture stuff, the new stuff, you know, architecture components, room, view model, uh, live data, whatever. That all works um, with Doppel libraries in the iOS context, right? And hopefully, if people in the community get into this, you can create your own libraries and publish them in the standard format. That will work with this tool, right? And then uh, coming pretty soon, we have Xcode support. So um, it works with Swift, but setting up your Xcode project is not, let's say, uh, pleasant. So we're going to have a thing probably after DroidCon New York that comes out that helps you create a, an iOS framework from your code uh, semi-automatically, and then you can just use it. So that's what's coming soon. Um, OK, great. That's what it is. Uh, but why? And the first thing is uh, the obvious. It's just to don't repeat yourself. Uh, code duplication is time consuming and error prone. And it just kind of feels wrong. I've been running um, Touch Lab. We have somebody here who's been at Touch Lab <laughs> for, uh, for since 2010. And most of the work since we were an Android only shop for a long time was really, here's our iOS app, make the Android app, uh, and we're not going to pay you as much, and don't put all the features in, and don't redesign it. Like, that's the conversations you have. So you're basically copying apps, and it just feels like, to be honest, shit work after seven years. Um, and it's just not the way to do it. And as a manager and a developer myself, you know, if all you're doing is just a lot of copying, eventually maybe the good people don't stay around that long, you know? Um, so plenty of reasons. They're pretty obvious, I think, to a developer. Um, these platforms are very similar. So, uh, fun fact, Android has a main thread and background threads. iOS has a main thread and background threads to do all the same UI and system stuff it does. It has SQLite, local files, networking, location. All these things exist on both platforms. Um, I like to say that they are same methods, different names. And yes, iOS and Android are so different, it's like Coke and Pepsi, but at the same time, it's, it's like soda water in a can. It's like the same thing, just different faces. So, uh, if you can imagine, a theoretical thing that we'll call mobile VM. And you have an MVVM reactive architecture, and you have local DB and files and threading and networking and easy interop with a native code that doesn't get in the way of your you know, daily life, uh, large community with library selection, optimized IDE and support experience, and it compiles down to Android or iOS, and you can do Android Studio and Xcode to build your UIs. Imagine this thing existed, right? Um, that's what that would look like. What we're doing is essentially doing that, subtracting one platform out of the mix, and just making Android that standard platform that will run on iOS. Um, the Android apps are 100% native. There is no cross-platform code on there. And you get to use all these libraries and stuff, right? So it looks more like this. Um, you got your native stuff. You got your uh, fractivities at the top there, and then all of your architecturally bits here. And as long as you adhere to an MVX architecture and, and understand that you're going to have to share this code, you don't get into trouble, and you can pretty much do this. And then you just implement your stuff over here, right? Uh, very clearly, though, this is not UI. And uh, if you've been doing this long enough, I think every time somebody tries to come out with a, a cross-platform UI thing, it tends to just be you know, garbage, right? Um, I, I found this, it's like uh, on the GTK website of like, here's our mobile implementation, like look how great it is. And uh, that's just trash, right? Or toilet implementation. I was having fun with Keynote. Um, so, and I also, uh, I just did a slide in there because I thought this was hilarious and it has nothing to do with the talk. That's for you, I hope you enjoy it. Okay, um, the next thing is uh, smooth interoperability. And I think this is one of those things that is not really done well 
with any of the things that are out there. Um, I'm sure some people who use the other things might disagree, but I'm going to explain why. Uh, it's natural intuitive. There's a Java interface that you basically can just talk to from both platforms or, or probably an abstract class or whatever you would normally do. Um, you can implement those things, either Java and Kotlin in your Android side and Objective-C or Swift on your iOS side. They're very easy to mix. Also, very importantly, you can share some of your code. You can pick what level of sharing you want to do, a whole ton or just a little bit, like maybe a complex piece. Um, this also means uh, the two weeks out from release nightmare issue. So if you're using some odd platform and you're two weeks out from release and something just isn't working, you know, you don't really have that freak out moment. You just cut out the thing that's shared, you code it natively, and you fix it after release. So your like, escape route is much less scary, if, uh, if you know what I mean. So um, we're going to talk about the Java shared code. We've got at the top, it is a view model that extends view model. Uh, this is like the new architecture stuff. And up here, we've got host. Host is an interface. And this is what you're going to implement from your native UIs. And we kind of call back to them and do stuff, right? Um, and then down here, when you call into this, it passes in a host. We wire up some you know, Rx stuff. And when the things come back, we just pass that back to the host and do things with them, right? So on the left, you've got your Kotlin. And notice the, the interface methods, data refresh. It does some stuff with the, the event info that comes back. And you get report error and update RSVP. And over here, this is what you're doing on the Swift side. And it's the same basic stuff, same methods, very similar looking syntax. Um, in fact, Kotlin and Swift. Uh, tend to share a lot of architectural similarities, at least in syntactic similarities, and what you can do with them. So um, there's another talk that I want to point people to when the video comes out, and it's just a, comparing that. So it's an interesting mix of things, right? So um, overall, what we're really trying to do is uh, there's this Android, you know, you got Android Studio and the Android architecture stuff that's coming out and the community, like everybody's here, everybody's all over the place meeting and getting together, writing libraries, Stack Overflows, all this stuff. And rather than building some like third thing that you then have to build all these other things for, we're trying to leverage it and draft off it. So, you know, we're the bike behind the truck, right? Um, and as, uh, oh, as an example, I couldn't go to I.O. Uh, for a long story reason I'm not going to get into, but uh, they released Room, and then the next morning it took about 90 minutes to get Room working on iOS. And that's just an example of like, once you understand how these things mix together, it, it works out really well. Performance, uh, you can't read it, but it's essentially, um, I did the database uh, benchmark I did a couple years ago, and I ran it on Android and iOS, and in general, uh, the iPhone would beat out a live Android phone. Uh, even like some kind of sometimes comparable phones, except uh, sometimes reflection kind of was slower in iOS, but that's a, that's a whatever. Um, okay, so the business case. And I'm going to go right through this real quick. There's a much longer analysis if you want to talk about it. Um, I will go on and on, trust me. So uh, the assumptions that I make are that native tools are the best for either platform. And by that, I mean, if you were building an app that was only going to ever deploy on iOS, and you picked React Native as your development platform, and you had access to whatever developers you'd want, you would be crazy. And I say that because there's a thing that I call the platform tax. It's going to take longer to build the same functionality in this other platform, right? Um, it's going to take, let's say, if it was going to take you four weeks to do an MVP on Android and Android Studio, it'll take you like six plus to do React Native or Xamarin or some other thing, right? And uh, you know, that is not an uncontroversial opinion to people who like React Native or other things, right? But it's not magic. And I talk to people who use React Native and other things, and, and it's not like it's all just roses. Like, there's, there's things, you know. Um, I just kind of threw this in because I thought that was hilarious. We get into a lot of arguments. Um, it's uh, the road less traveled in a lot of cases. So the library and support maturity, IDE and tools, uh, the weird build and runtime issues, you know, maybe missing features that are on these platforms, and what I like to call the WTF moments, um, where you know, it just won't build. So the progression is like, well, do a clean build, and do a new checkout, then maybe reinstall your IDE, and if it gets really bad, go get a new laptop. You know what I mean? Like, if this has never happened to you besides the laptop one, uh, I, I don't know if you've been developing very long. So the weirder the platform you're using, the more likely you're going to hit these things. Um, it's a little bit of FUD, I agree, 
but it happens. So uh, yeah, the road less traveled. It's traveled for a reason. So, and then once you do that first piece of functionality, you still need to implement the other UI. Um, Xamarin, pretty much 100%, unless you use Xamarin Forms, you're going to have to build the other UI. Uh, React Native is still, like, you still do a lot of platform specific stuff, right? Anyway, so uh, which platform takes longer to build? And uh, I'm at an Android conference, so I think people would say iPhone. And, uh, and if I went to an iPhone meeting, they'd say Android. And it's a trick question, because the first one takes longer to build. Um, even with perfect specs, you're going to be testing and modifying architectural ideas, and you're going to be sorting out issues with your backend team's API and um, all this stuff. Running a, a second platform shop for years, we can take advantage of this, because the client already has an idea of what the first platform cost. So uh, you, know, you can quote them, and it, you know, they don't really kind of get the fact that the second platform is going to have a lot of lessons learned. But even that, there's no perfect specs, right? Uh, Agile exists because nobody knows what they want. So you're going to be doing a lot of work, and you're going to be throwing stuff away. And it is valuable waste. But uh, it's still a waste, right? And if you have this platform tax, this slower dev tax, it's on everything, right? So um, you're multiplying the damage you're doing. Like I talk to people, and they're like, yeah, yeah, we're going to build native apps, but we're going to do a quick mock-up on, on React or HTML5 and get it out there and see what people think. And I, like, I just don't get that. I can't convince them that it's just going to be quicker to do a mock-up in Android Studio. But it is. I mean, yeah, you can't push that to iOS immediately, but you could just build a native app with some buttons and, and get the same feedback. So anyway, some people won't agree with that, but I say it, so see how it goes. Um, risk, another part of the business case. Android in this framework is 100% native, and if we're being honest, Android is a riskier platform to deploy for. Right? Um, some people don't like that statement, but it is true. There are many more phones and versions and all kinds of weird stuff going on. iOS, they have more screens now, but you can still count them. You know what I mean? Like, there's not that many. Um, sharing code is optional, so you can share a little bit a lot, as said before. And you don't need to rewrite your apps or train a new skill set, obviously, besides running Doppel. Um, so it's minimizing the risk. And then I have this other sort of argument, which is like, uh, you know, two UIs, like, yeah, but we live in a world where everyone's still building two UIs. Until somebody figures out how to not do that, you got to do it, right? Uh, and then there's also this argument of, like, I think teams can kind of switch from being iOS and Android to be more like senior people are doing architecture and skeletal UIs, and you have more of UI teams that understand Kotlin and Swift and yada, yada. It's a long argument. This slide is a toilet slide. I just didn't finish it, but uh, we'll move on. And it's an important point I'm just not making well for this talk, but come back next year. Okay, um, security. Uh, again, sharing is optional. Sensitive endpoints can be handed off to native iOS stuff rather than trying to do it in some shared paradigm. I think this really helps with security. Uh, SQL Cypher was ported. There's kind of interesting encryption stuff going on. Um, I've talked to people about React Native specifically in the context of uh, security and talked to someone who works at a bank. And, and their security people said, no, no way. And I don't understand exactly why. But, and it might just be this fear of the unknown, but I'm trying to understand why. And we're trying to give an option that allows you to uh, work around the really sensitive security bits. So um, the end of the story from the business case is look, high efficiency, low risk. And um, the fastest product dev cycle time, and no compromise UX, low platform risk, and, and doing the simple thing. And, and it's, it's a big decision to pick some third party thing. And I've had good stories from React, and Xamarin, and PhoneGap, and Ionic, or whatever. And then, but you're also going to hear horror stories with people starting over and just shit went wrong. And um, this concept is something that you don't have to hit the reset button if it doesn't work. And I think that's like the most important risk argument in this whole bunch, right? So let that wash over your mind. And then we have some fun little visuals. So, you know, do the simple thing. Don't get this weird, complicated stuff, yada, yada. So moving on. Uh, DroidCon NYC iOS app, AKA the sad puppy. Um, we built this for uh, 2016 DroidCon. And uh, we published it, and Apple said no. And I had a little screenshot that said, uh, Apple said it was not appropriate for the App Store because it said Android. And it had a little Android guy. So I made a quick joke and covered the Android guy with this little picture. And then I replaced Android with Sad Puppy throughout the app. 
And they said yes. So that exists. And I, uh, first of all, I'm not like, I wish I had more time to do the joke because I didn't think they would take it. Uh, it's not a puppy, it's a full grown dog. So the joke doesn't even really make sense. Um, but whatever, moving on. So, uh, but that app is old. And I found this commit from July 20th of 2014. And, and it's funny because we had two commits. First of all, we were starting Kotlin in 2014, which was like crazy time. And second of all, we also were trying out this retrofit thing. Like that's how old this, uh, the code that's in this app is. So even though it was using this cross-platform stuff, we had a bunch of homegrown libraries and event bus, uh, event bus, <laughs> and uh, retrofit one, and you know, non-retrofit networking, which is uh, everyone remembers when you had to write your own networking libraries because that was cool. Uh, no RX Java and yada yada. So uh, for the happy sad puppy's birthday. We're going to do uh, Retrofit 2. Well, we have done. This, is, this talk is old. We've done this stuff. Um, RX Java 2, Architecture Components in Room, right? So uh, very briefly, and I know that live coding is, is, uh, is, is often a dumpster fire, but I, I'm going to show you uh, view model with Android Architecture Components iOS. iOS. So uh, bear with me as I try to do this as swiftly as possible. And I'm going to mirror displays, and then we're going to go into here. And we're going to go into presenter mode. OK. So uh, if you look at the top here, we're going to implement, or at least see how the screen that shows you the detail of the speaker in our app is displayed. So we've got view model. Uh, we've got this interactor thing, which uh, I won't get into. I'm not super excited about some of my team's choice of architecture. But anyway, um, composite disposable, which is you don't know what these things are. Don't worry. And a uh, flowable transformer, which is just going to apply the threading context we're going to use. So in testing, you don't have to do multiple threads, yada, yada. So we have an interface here called host. And host is the thing we're going to be talking to in the shared code. And if we don't find the user, we're going to post this method. And if we do, we're going to post this method. And the implementations are going to deal with it. Also notice that the non-null annotation, which is uh, going to make Kotlin happy, and also J2OBJC passes that through. So Swift is also aware of these things. OK, so um, in here, we have a method called wire, and we pass in this host, which will be the native implementation. And we wire up these disposables. And when these things happen, or sorry, the observable, flowable, um, if we find the user, we pass that through to unuser found. And if we don't, we call this method. I will point out that the way this works using uh, room is actually the open the flowable and keep that hanging around forever. So when you change the database, it gets pushed up to the UI, which I think is, you know, a neat architectural thing. So, in uh, in Android, uh, come on, buddy, user detail fragment. So here we've got the Kotlin code, and we get user detail view host, which we just talked about. Um, we get our view model with a factory. We wire it by passing in this thing, which implements that, and we get a Find your user ID just goes and gets the intent and gets the ID. And then down here, we've got find user error, which does some error stuff. And we've got on user found, which does some user found stuff. That's how that works, right? Really, really not super complicated. Is anybody lost? I'm going to assume not. OK. Um, cool. So then in iOS, uh, we have the user detail view controller. And if you're not aware of iOS, view controller is kind of like an activity. So there's that. Um, but we're not implementing that, that host yet. And this thing is upset because it doesn't have the right stuff. So like every good cooking show, I'm going to show you pretty much something that's complete and just finish the implementation. So we implement host. And great, now the self thing is happy because we're wiring correctly. But this is upset because we don't have the methods. So we're going to do find user error. And it's a demo, so I'm going to do nothing when we have an error. And uh, on user found. And it passes in that thing, and I won't do anything yet. So we'll hit play. And um, you know, I don't know. There's not really any important points here. Obviously, it's just creating this stuff as if it's normal uh, Objective C underneath uh, Swift, which it is. And then these things work, right? So when we click in here, you know, we go to the screen, and then nothing happens because when the user came back, I didn't do anything. So. Uh, and when this happens again, it takes a little while. 
It's not quite a dumpster fire, but it's a little slow. There we go. So, and then, you know, bam. No, a little clapping. No, okay. Um, cool. <laughs> Thank you. It wasn't really uh, serious coding, live coding, but. Um, all right. So that's the only problem with this is now I've got to find this guy. There we go. All right. So uh, the status. We're in technical preview, which we did a month and change ago, which really just means it works, but it's going to change a lot, and I don't want to deal with people freaking out when it changes, but you can definitely use it. We are using it in live production apps for our clients. Um, all of this is Apache 2. So I know that there were some recent licensing uh, brouhaha's going on in other parts of the, the community, and I, we all just decided to not get in any way involved in that. Um, you can check out the tutorial and sample docs at that website, but I, you know, you'll find it if you just go to the website. A uh, quick note about libraries, like we used to be for a long time, it was Retrofit 1 because of OKHTP, uh, RxJava 1 because just it took forever to get that to work, but now Retrofit 2 is coming. Um, that should be ready uh, for you know public consumption by the Joy-Con. You know, so a few weeks used to have a race condition a couple weeks ago, but it fixed it. It's amazing. Had nothing to do with Retrofit 2, by the way. And uh, RX Java 2 works, but it still needs some work on um, memory kind of issues. So uh, that should be following on in a few weeks as well. Also, weird edge case or race condition. Very edge case, but. Still figuring it out. And then the Swift help, uh, again, as mentioned, I think most Android developers are not really going to want to get into this too much, figuring out Xcode. So we're going to try to help along with that. Um, this sounds great, but there are issues. And, and this is mostly just the nature of J2OBJC. So I'm just going to tell you what they are. Uh, first of all, J2OBJC is not garbage collected the way Java is garbage collected. It is garbage, garbage collected the way iOS does garbage collection, which is reference counting. So if your objects uh, reference each other in a cycle, you will have memory leaks. And when I tell that to Java people, it's like a hard pass, but I, I think you should know in practice, number one, it's not as often as you think there are tools to help you with this in both J2OBJC and in Xcode tool, tool chain, and also just like, hey, you know, the iOS people have been doing this since day one, it's really not that bad, except RxJava. RxJava makes memory cycles like, like it was its job. That's a different discussion. We're working on it. Um, there's some runtime size hit that comes along on the iOS side. And um, that's a long discussion, and it's difficult to figure out exact numbers because of the way Apple does all of its stuff. Uh, but it's generally not too bad. But if you don't have a lot of code that's shared, then you should not be using this. And that's just like a simple answer. I'll just tell you that. And it's going to be difficult if you're building a framework you give to other people to include this in the framework because it's going to add more weight than they would like. That's the way it is. And debugging, uh, the code that gets produced in Objective-C is like kind of readable once you understand the pattern. But uh, I wouldn't say it's super pleasant. So when you run into situations where you have something wrong in your shared code that wasn't wrong in your Android code, which thankfully is not like super common, it's a little difficult to debug. Um, there are ways around that, but it's just one of those things that hopefully gets better over time. Uh, I will say that adding no extra weight to the shared code thing means that you don't have any extra problems on Android, right? So uh, Instant Apps has that weight limit that is somewhat of an issue. So something to think about. You can kind of get around it. Uh, great, but Kotlin and iOS is trash, right? I uh, absolutely agree. So why should you care? And the answer is uh, you shouldn't care, right? Kotlin is great. I still like Java, though, but they're still awesome. Um, if your team or your management or whatever is totally cool with just doing fully native dev, I don't think you should even really worry about this too much. Um, and except for like rare cases, if you show up to your iOS team's like sprint planning meeting, and you're like, hey, I got this really weird thing that's going to like do your job for you. Like, you know, it's not going to be something that they want. Um, they're probably not going to like it very much, right? My general impression, uh, my own included, is anytime someone presents a cross-platform thing to me, it's kind of like this, right? Um, nobody wants to hear this stuff. And we've gone into uh, meetings with uh, potential clients. They brought us in to talk about how do we best improve our developer efficiency. And we're talking to some folks, and then you go meet with the, the Android team. This happened recently. And the Android team was like, nah, we don't, that's Java. We don't want to touch that. We're going to do everything Kotlin from now on. 
Um, the iOS team's like, yeah, 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 no, thanks, we don't want to do that. And my point to them was, uh, you, you know, I'm not here for you, <laughs> right? I'm here because the management people are now talking about crazy ideas, like, you know, why do we need two apps? And I've heard about this other thing, and I've heard about React, and we should check this out, right? So I can still make an argument that doing something in, in a cross-platform framework is going to be slower than just building two apps if you do it a smart way. Uh, I can make that argument. But that argument doesn't sound very smart when the people that are like talking about the numbers don't understand the technology to begin with. So it's kind of one of those things where like, I think it's cool tech. I think we use it, and if you're building for multiple platforms and you're open to it, it's something that is cool and you should check it out. If you aren't super interested, but you, know, you start hearing grumblings from other parts of your team that, hey, we're going to check out this other thing. And we should really look at this. And, and making two apps isn't economical anymore. And I've heard about this awesome stuff. Um, you should think about it. Because uh, you know, someday it, like, you're going to suddenly be, hey, you know, why don't you learn JavaScript and let's try this React Native thing finally. Um, so my, my sales pitch is uh, you know, in the meeting where they're talking about this, the, the safe option sounds like let's make two native apps. But it doesn't sound like the smart option. So uh, give them the safe and smart option, uh, Dapple salesperson. So. Um, that's it. Do you have any questions? Ah, cool. I wanted to compare this to the Xamarin thing. And from what I understood, uh, it's just Xamarin has a third, third language that, uh, that you compile to two main platforms. And you just have one that's already first class language for one of the platforms. Mm -hmm. And also they have like the Xamarin forms, but that doesn't count. So that's it. Yeah. So why not Xamarin? Uh, no, no. Oh. <laughs> I mean, if that's it, then. So it's I'm a comment. Like, yeah. <laughs> that's so much a question. Yeah. Okay. I mean, I did, You know, it's interesting. This goes back to about a year and a half ago. We were working on this um, this thing called Research Stack, which is like the Android equivalent of Research Kit, which Apple built, which is a thing for medical research frameworks, which sounds great as long as you have an iPhone, right? So it was like, yet again, here we go, some, some platform-specific crap. Um, so I started working a lot with Xamarin. And I love C Sharp, actually. I think it's a great language. Um, Xamarin Studio is, uh, or at least was, horrendous. I think it still is pretty bad. And, and it's, uh, I, get, I get really into this whole discussion of, um, yeah, these things work, but the developer efficiency is, is lower. So. Um, the discussion around them is usually like, hey, we'll get two apps for the price of one, or two apps for the price of one and a half. But it's ignoring the fact that it's going to take you longer just to get anything done. And, and that's not inherent in Xamarin or C Sharp, per se, but the tooling around it and the libraries and the community and everything else involved um, is not necessarily as efficient. And that's the thing, like, you know, there's a lot of talk about React Native, and I'm like, yeah, but Facebook doesn't have the same financial in, uh, incentive to make React Native work that Google has in improving Android Studio, and that Xcode has in, in being you know, better than everything else, right? So um, I, I don't know. It just seems to me like these things aren't going to be great. And then I also point out to people, like, you know how much of the Facebook app is React Native? Uh, like none, <laughs> you know what I mean? So it's a little like, I, I don't really trust it. And then there's stuff like Flutter coming out of Google. Google's kind of confusing about their messaging, and um, I, I describe it as it's like prison with a bunch of different gangs that fight each other, right? So uh, politely. So you know, one team at Google is going to say you should do progressive web apps, right? But until Apple decides that that's something that they want, which I don't see them doing anytime soon, like I don't think that's really going to work out very well. And then, um, then they're like, oh, you should use Flutter. But it's like um, until everyone is OK with one UI and not too worried about what happens when you need native stuff, like, I, I don't know. I don't see that thing taking over. They all have these compromises that I hope that we can figure out some better ways going forward to, to have less of. So. Yeah, UI is just too complicated. That's why the Xamarin forms even like being 2.5, I guess, now. It, it's also still, a toilet thing, yeah. Yeah, it's still yeah. a toilet thing. <laughs> yeah, it's pretty bad. Okay. Oh, yeah. Cool. Well, thank, thank you. you. I have uh, two questions. Yeah. First of all, it, uh, I saw you making changes to the Swift code that was generated. So if you made further changes to your Android app, that, would, they, 
That wasn't, that wasn't generated code. That was the code that you write to wire your UI components into the shared code. Oh, my bad then. Yeah, yeah. Um, but is, are the, are the files, files wiped every time you compile from Android to Swift? Um, or would you have system dependent changes that would survive each compilation? Um, well, so uh, the design is that you don't, you, you really shouldn't change any of the generated code. Um, it's, you just can't, because if you do, it's going to get overwritten. Um, it's definitely a one way through. However, it's designed for, you know, as you're iterating on the Java code, um, you, just, you just push everything over and it should, should keep up. Um, yeah, so just don't ever change the generated code. Okay. Ever. So. Would, would you recommend, like, doing the two applications at the same time to see if there's any, like, box of changes? Or would you just finish the Android application and then just hand it over to, like, the iOS team if that, if that was one of those? Um, I, you know, I think that this, is, this all comes down to how, what you're building and how. So there's, um, I, I don't know, it, like, in most cases, I wouldn't say, hey, build the entire app and get it out the door and then start on your iOS app. But I would definitely say that if you want to make sure you take twice as long to build an app, build both of them at the same time, because you're going to be making all the same mistakes. So if you can do uh, a few weeks lead time on the Android side and sort out your architectural stuff and maybe do some user feedback so you can, you know, there's a lot of stuff you just don't have to build on the second platform. Um, but it all de depends on what you're building. I definitely wouldn't really do them at the same time, you know, so. Cool. All right. Uh, I have one question. Is there something like the content provider uh, provided by your tool? Uh, no. And the issue with content provider is um, there are things that don't make sense in an iOS context, right? It depends what you're using content provider for. I also am somebody who's like not a fan of content provider because it turned into a thing where everyone used it all the time, even if you weren't sharing data outside of your app. So I always found it to be this like architectural extra work. And not everyone agrees with me on that, <laughs> like I get it. Um, but you know, I think in that case, if you really wanted to use a content provider, what you can do is the code that's actually gonna be taking the URLs and parsing them and dealing with the SQL and doing all that, um, put that in shared code, and then just have your content provider and your platform specific code that can call into it. And then on iOS, you would just call into it, which is the whole point of like optional sharing. And, and it's very easy to do that kind of um, sharing architecture. But I'm like, unless I'm wrong, I don't think you can just like expose data to other apps on iOS. Like that wasn't an architectural purpose that they had, you know? But it's also good because like, unlike other platforms, you know, every time there's a new version of iOS or Android, you don't need to like rewrap all the bindings. We're just trying to do like the 80-20 rule, where you're like, you share a bunch of stuff, but don't, don't lose your mind and try to share everything. So that was sort of the architectural mandate, for lack of a better word. Anybody else? Um, we are in the phase of like, please go try it if you're remotely uh, like technically curious and like to see weird stuff, I know this seems weird, go clone the app and build the Android Droidcon app uh, and see what it's doing. And if you want any help, go on the little Slack group or find me on Twitter. I will absolutely, like I'm super invested in making this happen. Um, it's not just I want this to happen. I think, um, I don't really think that Google or Apple or in some cases Facebook is necessarily gonna build the thing that's gonna like it's going to have to come from a little more from community, a thing that helps us to, to build better. I could be wrong. Google might come out with, like, here's the Kotlin share everywhere and everything works and it's, like, super awesome. I, I could be wrong. But it, it seems like that is not their focus. And in as much as this may be useful for the developers out there who have to be more efficient in development, um, it's going to take people trying it and it's going to take community feedback and then hopefully we can work on the next thing and the next thing and whatever those are. But, you know. That's, uh, that's my plea to the world. Please try it out. So uh, yeah, that's it. Thank you very much.